I'm Kristen Kelly for the University of California, Irvine, and it's my pleasure to speak to you today about Sturge Weber syndrome. Specifically, I'm going to talk about port wine birthmarks and treatment. Now, many of you watching this may be familiar with Sturge Weber syndrome. Uh, it is a condition that affects the development of blood vessels, and that effect on the development of blood vessels can have a variety of effects for the individual. There can be a port wine birthmark, there can be an eye involvement, there can also be brain involvement. And not all those with Sturge Weber syndrome have all of the above. You may just have two of them, but by definition, you have to have two in order to have the diagnosis. Today, I'm going to be focusing on port wine birthmarks and treatment for those. Now, how can, why do we want to treat these? And one of the reasons is because we do know that in a, percent of it of in, in a percentage of individuals, the port wine birthmark can darken and thicken over time and develop what we call nodules or little bumps in them. And sometimes those nodules can bleed and or cause discomfort. This was a study from Roy Geronimus in New York, and he followed one patient over a number of years and actually over several decades, you can see. And you can, you can see that it, while it started as kind of a flat pink to red lesion, over time it became darker red and then more of a purple lesion and eventually developed more nodules. And there was also what we call some hypertrophy or thickening of the tissue in that area. So this is why we often treat because we can sometimes minimize this happening. Again, I do wanna point out that this doesn't happen to everyone, but right now we're not able to predict which individuals this will occur in. And so what, this is one reason that we like to try to treat early when possible. Now, in the past treatments for port wine birthmarks, sometimes people will be nervous about treatments because they'll say, well, they cause a burn or they cause scarring. And I will tell you, decades ago, in the early, uh, in the 60s, 1960s and 1970s, uh, people didn't have good laser treatments, which we're gonna talk about today. So they used other treatments and some of which caused some significant scarring. This includes cutting the lesions out, which of course makes no sense because in general, they're uh, extensive areas. It included freezing, but freezing so much that it would cause a scar there, so also not a good uh, option, and or radiation treatments, also not a good option because you can develop skin cancers in those areas later on. These are past treatments. These are not things that are used today, so no one should be exposed to this at this time because we have much better options that do not cause scarring. The main option that we use, certainly here in the United States, but really around the world, uh, is LASER, or which stands for Light Amplification for the Stimulated Emission of Radiation. So let's talk a little bit more about what a laser is. Now, laser is light. Of course, we, all, we know about light bulbs. We all have them in our houses. So what makes a light bulb different from a laser? Because certainly we don't use a light bulb as a therapeutic uh, treatment most of the time. There are a couple key differences. First of all, a light bulb has all the colors or multiple colors. It's polychromatic. Whereas a laser has one color and we have chosen that color so it's going to selectively be absorbed by uh, the blood vessels which we want to target. A light bulb is incoherent. So the light is going in all different directions where the laser light is coherent. It's traveling all together in one pattern to target what we want. And then the laser light is much more intense than a light bulb light. But again, it has these other special features which allow us to target what we want and not injure the surrounding skin. Now we use lasers a lot in medicine. Uh, it's not only used in dermatology, although certainly lasers are used extensively in dermatology, but in other fields, including ophthalmology. But in dermatology, well, today we're gonna to be talking about port wine birthmarks and blood vessel lesions that we treat. We also use it to treat pigmented lesions. We can use it to remove tattoos. We do laser hair removal. We can rejuvenate the skin. Sometimes we use it to treat acne or vitiligo where people have lost the pigment in their skin. Keep in mind though, that we use different lasers or different settings for each of those things. And we end up, a experienced laser surgeon knows the right settings to target what we want. So it's not that, that we would use the same laser for all things. We would use different lasers and different techniques in different settings. So again, I wanna just kind of review that our objective with laser surgery is to have uh, the laser light to go through the epidermis, which is the surface of the skin, and then down into the dermis, which is the second layer of the skin, and then target these blood vessels without causing any damage to the surrounding tissue. And that's really what makes this treatment magical and very effective because we are able to do this selective targeting. 
Now, when they started using lasers early on, and again, we're talking uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, they saw that they could improve birthmarks, but the earliest lasers didn't have the right settings. They didn't have the capability for the technology at that time. And so there were some times that skin damage occurred and even scarring. Again, this was uh, you know, a number of decades ago, uh, but since then we've gotten much better at um, using them. And I like to mention that because sometimes people will say, oh, I know someone who had a treatment and they caused a lot of scarring. And with, when used correctly, that should not happen with these devices. So I want to reassure people about that. So the, what we have that allows us to selectively target what we want is this theory of selective photothermolysis. Box Anderson and John uh, Parrish in Harvard in Boston came up with this idea. And again, what we are going to be targeting is a specific colored structure in the skin, which is the blood. And then we're going to try to get those extra blood vessels to go away, which we find in port wine birthmarks. We're going to choose settings so that it's, the light is absorbed by the blood that we're targeting and not by the surrounding tissue so that we don't cause any destruction to areas that we don't want it. This kind of shows you in a picture what we're trying to target and you can see we have a certain wavelength that can target our blood vessels. There might be another wavelength that we would choose that would target melanin or the pigment of the skin, but when we're treating port wine birthmarks, we're just going to use that wavelength that's going to target the blood vessels. Now this is another example. This is an egg model that we use and it kind of shows you because uh, we can use the membrane of the egg, we can fire a laser at it, and you can see that there are excuse me, there are blood vessels here uh, that were targeted and they cause little uh, injury because they cause a little areas of where the blood is leaking out there. But you will also know that the surrounding tissue does not appear injured. It looks perfectly fine, just like it should look. So that really shows us how those blood vessels can be targeted. Now, there are a couple important settings that we have to be able to get this kind of controlled injury. I've talked a number of times about the wavelength, so that's the color of light, so we choose the right wavelength to target our blood vessels. We also choose the pulse duration, that's how long the light is on for each pulse. And that is one of the things they didn't have with some of the earlier lasers. They had longer pulse durations, but we now know the pulse durations that we need to target those blood vessels safely. And then we also have to choose the correct energy. And both the pulse duration and energy may vary a little bit over time to get different sized blood vessels, but there's a range that we know that we can use safely. Now there's one other part of this story. So selective photothermolysis that we've been talking about greatly improved our treatment outcomes, but there were still a number of challenges. Multiple treatments were required, and this is still the case today, but it was even more then because they couldn't use very high energies. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. Uh, incomplete lesion removal, and I will still say this is a challenge a little bit. It's hard sometimes to get 100% removal. I would say most patients don't get 100%, although often we can get a very high percentage of removal. It was very hard to treat darker skin types, and we'll talk about that again a little bit more, and the treatments were fairly uncomfortable. And again, we have ways to address that now. One of the reasons for that is, as I mentioned before, the light has to pass through this epidermis, the surface of the skin, and that's where there's melanin. That's what gives us the pigment in our skin. If we didn't have that, then we would all be white like a white piece of paper. Uh, but this gives us, the melanin gives us pigment in our skin, but the laser light has to pass through that, and that absorbs energy. And when it absorbs that energy, it can cause pain. It, because patients with darker skin types have more melanin, they can get the energy absorbed there, and not, the light does not get to where we want it. So the answer for that was something called epidermal cooling. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. That was developed both at the Beckman Laser Institute by Stuart uh, Nelson and Lars Fossen uh, and Tom Milner. Uh, that's where I work as the Beckman Laser Institute at University of California, Irvine, as full disclosure. But also uh, another method of cooling was developed at Weldman Laboratories. Uh, Rox Anderson that I mentioned previously also developed. So there are multiple methods we have to protect that surface of the skin so the surface is not damaged and we can get those blood vessels underneath. And this is something that we call epidermal cooling. So uh, we apply something that cools the surface of the skin and it just cools down the surface. So then the surface temperature decreases the surface is not damaged as the laser light passes through it, and then the laser light gets to the blood vessels and it can have the effect we want. So again, the cooling allows us to protect the surface so it's not injured and we can get a good effect in the blood vessels. This allows us to use higher energies, which are more effective. It allows us to treat patients of all skin types. I will tell you honestly, it is more difficult to treat patients with darker skin types because of the melanin, but this ectomal cooling does allow us to do that. And it also decreases the treatment discomfort because it protects that surface 
and when it's uh, when that surface is damaged, it causes pain. But again, we can protect it now. These are the different kinds of cooling that we use. Crichton spray cooling is the one that was developed at UC Irvine. That's a millisecond spray of tetrafluoroethane, and it cools the skin just very quickly, allows the laser light to go through. You don't see any uh, anything on the skin surface just for a, a moment. You see just a little bit of that spray, and then it uh, is rapidly um, evaporated. Contact cooling is kind of a cool plate that can the laser can fire through, and that can also be used. And then there's air cooling, which is kind of like a hair dryer, but cold air, and that can also be used. So those are the three methods of cooling that we use to protect the surface of the skin. So now let me tell you about what uh, people experience when they have laser treatments so that you have a little bit of information. In preparation for laser treatments, sun protection is important because uh, if we have extra melanin, again, it, you can get some absorption of that laser light. So it's good to protect the surfaces of the skin both before the treatment and then after to allow the best healing. It's important to have annual eye exams uh, if there's any uh, suspicion or possibility of Sturge Weber syndrome, because we of course want to make sure that your eyes are healthy. And then it's also important to have neurology exams if that's uh, appropriate for the individual. Now, as I mentioned, the treatments, there can be some discomfort associated with them. So definitely you should have a conversation with your laser surgeon about what kind of anesthesia you're gonna use. I will tell you that many of my uh, patients that come to see me and I have patients from uh, all over the world don't need uh, any anesthesia. There are a variety of things we can do. I uh, do little sections of it. We'll sometimes do some uh, cold gel and some ice to help with that. And that's one option. Sometimes we'll inject uh, some anesthetic into the area that we're going to be treating. And for that, some people, that's a good option. Some people prefer to have an uh, injection into their arm for a pain medication about an hour before the treatment. And again, that's an option. And then there are patients who can have monitor anesthesia care. So an anesthesiologist is there. They're not fully asleep, but an anesthesiologist is there to help them to relax. And then in some cases where it's an extensive treatment or it's expected that it's going to be particularly uncomfortable or particularly stressful for a patient, general anesthesia can be used. Now the decision for general an anesthesia is an individual uh, decision. In general, uh, the patients uh, that we see with Serge Weber syndrome are healthy and so they are uh, good candidates. They can have general anesthesia. The period of anesthesia is relatively short. Most of our treatments can be done in about 10 minutes or sometimes 15 minutes, sometimes five. So uh, it's a very short period of anesthesia. But again, this is not needed for everyone. Many people do not require this, but it can be an option for some people. Now, the other thing in preparation for laser treatment is making sure the appropriate eye protection. If we're going to be treating off the face, then people can wear uh, the correct laser protective goggles. But when we're going to be treating on the face, and of course, patients with Sturge Weber syndrome often have facial port one uh, birthmarks, then if it's going to be not, if we're not treating the eyelid, we can use these laser safe eye pads that you can see on the bottom. If we are going to be treating the eyelid, then we use a corneal shield, which are these ones uh, on the top here, which are uh, kind of like contact lenses. I put a little bit of anesthetic in the eye so it's not uncomfortable when it goes in. I put a little bit of lubricant and I can just very quickly with just just easily slip this in just like you would a contact lens and these protect your eyes very well but it is important that your laser surgeon use the correct eye protection to keep you safe now this is our operating room where we do a lot of our procedures and you can see we have a lot of different lasers all the ones that are listed in this particular picture are something called a pulse dye laser, which is a very commonly used laser for these. It can work very well, but sometimes we'll move around our settings a little bit so I can get the best result. So in terms of post-operative care or treatment after the procedure, I often will have people do ice and elevation for the first one to two days. People may get some swelling and uh, bruising is pretty com is common. So the ice will minimize the swelling. You don't have to do it all the time, just but, but intermittently that first post-operative day. I also have people sleep with an extra pillow that day so that they'll have less swelling uh, when they wake up the next morning. For some people, many people don't need anything uh, for pain control afterwards, but for some people they do. We generally use a mild uh, pain medicine, something like acetaminophen. A brand name example would be something like Tylenol. Also, if people have any scabs or blisters, I have them use petrolatum or something like Vaseline uh, just to keep the area moist. And then, as I mentioned earlier, sun protection is important. 
Treatments are repeated at about four to eight week intervals. However, if people are traveling, that can be a little bit longer or if uh, sometimes we'll do it a little bit shorter, but that's a general range of, uh, of treatment intervals. And it's important to know for patients and families that multiple treatments are required. It is not uncommon for there to be 10, 15, 20 treatments and sometimes more. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the research that's going on and has been done recently and some of the uh, great progress that is uh, being made. We do have good treatments, but we want to make them even better for people. We want to, uh, birthmarks to go away in fewer treatments and to stay away and not to have recurrence because sometimes you can get some recurrence over time. So this was a fantastic uh, study that was done in uh, association with the surge driver syndrome, uh, which showed that this GNAQ gene, uh, a mutation or a change in that gene is what causes the majority of port wine birthmarks. And those are port wine birthmarks that are by themselves, so not associated with the syndrome, and those associated with surge driver syndrome. There are other gene changes that can cause port wine birthmarks, but this causes the majority of them. And knowing what that gene was really is important information because it should allow us to have more targeted treatments or treatments, you know, specific for those blood vessels uh, that have this change in the future. Just recently in, uh, in the last year, uh, with uh, the Sturge Weber Foundation and a number of experts from around the US and then around the world, there was this consensus statement for the management and treatment of port wine birthmarks in Sturge Weber syndrome that was uh, published in JAMA Dermatology. And this helped us to give some guidance as to, as to uh, how we should do these treatments. A lot of what I just went over uh, with you, but this is something that you could ask your practitioner about if they're familiar about it. I'm not going to go over all the points, but just mention a, a, a couple of key points, many of which uh, we discussed earlier in the talk. So one is we know that a port wine birthmark is the main skin finding for those with Sturge Weber syndrome. The best time for evaluation of a facial port wine birthmark is at birth because we want to determine if there is Sturge Weber syndrome and if there is to get treatment for the various components. And then it would be good to decide early on if treatment is going to be done for the port, port wine birthmark. We do often get better results when we start treatment earlier in infants, so ideally we would start in the first weeks of life. It's not that we can't start later, we certainly can, but that's great when we can start very early because we can often get a better result in terms of the majority of lesion being cleared by a year of age. That does, isn't the case for anyone, but that is our goal. We can treat patients of all skin types. As I mentioned, we use our cooling and we can adjust our settings. Uh, and Pulse dye laser, or laser in general, but especially the pulse dye laser is one of the most common treatments and can be used very safely in patients of all ages. Lastly, uh, as I mentioned, there can be discomfort associated with treatment, so it's good to have a discussion with your laser surgeon about how you will uh, address pain control and what would be the best way for you. Now, we also uh, worked with neurologists and ophthalmologists and uh, radiologists uh, in some other uh, guidelines. And so I'm sure you'll have other talks that will address these, but just know there have also been a consensus statement to address these other aspects of Sturge Weber syndrome. Now I wanted to talk just briefly about some of the other exciting things that are going on. This is optical coherence tomography, and this is kind of like an ultrasound, but it uses light. And there are not very many of these across the country or even the world right now. But there are getting to be some in various uh, institutions that do a lot of treatment of port wine birthmarks and other things. And this allows us to know more information about the blood vessels. If we, it can give us information about the size of the blood vessels that are in a certain area, how deep they are, and how dense they are, how many blood vessels there are in that area. And it is our hope that this information may be able to allow us to provide better treatments in the future. Still really research right now, but something that I think is coming for the future and could be very helpful. This is an example of a patient. This is an area on their chin where they had a port wine birthmark. We did the imaging and then we could see the size of the vessels, how deep they are. And this all helps us set our settings that we discussed at the beginning of the talk. Now, the other exciting information I mentioned that we know about GNAQ and here are some examples, but there are also some other gene changes that can occasionally happen that can cause port wine birthmarks. And it's going to become more common that people will be tested so we'll know the specific change in their port wine birthmark and we may have more specific treatments based on this. 
uh, Dr. Beth Brolet and Lisa Arkin at the University of Wisconsin are particularly doing some very exciting work on, on this, and I'm very pleased to be collaborating with them, trying to get more information so we can have even better treatments for patients. I want to thank you all for listening today. I certainly want to thank the students who have helped me pr prepare this. I want to thank the Sturge Weber Foundation for all their support, uh, both financially and then just overall for the uh, many years. Uh, and uh, thank you all for your attention today.